for me, language, the words, it's the other half of my personality and very, it's a giving and, and taking away. All I write for voice, it's never, music never transports only the poem. I think most of the great poems do not need any music. And uh, it's more a sort that you form a unit between the word and the, the sound. And if somebody expects now a sort of illustration of what Philippe Jacotte read, he's completely on the wrong path, I think. And when I write music about those short, very wonderful poems who are read on the recording by Jacotte, he had a very direct and very biological connection to, to his, uh, his poetry because he reads the poems, he is 92, with a very, very uh, spiritual voice who is nearly without any gravitation anymore, who is suspended in the air, a very magical sound of this voice. Oiseau Flamme sans cesse changeant d'air, qu'à peine on voit quand elle passe, crise en mouvement dans l'espace, peu ont la vision assez claire pour chanter même dans la nuit. I've written a lecture of poems of Jacques it's not the composition because sometimes really I read the poems, every letter of a poem is a note, is a rhythm. Sometimes I use just some little sentences, for instance, the, the distance between the very high mountains and, and the valleys are enormous intervals in music. And, and sometimes you hear in the night the birds, or you feel the the yeah, the art and the burning coals on your tongue when you speak, like it is in the in, in the poem. And I used eighths of tones and quarter tones, which really hurts you when you hear this. It, it's full of tension, it's music under enormous pressure, a compression of all the intervals. And it's different than just to write a, a composition for a song for, for voice and piano. But here I really read the poems with the two instruments. This is already the dialogue and then the dialogue between Marie-Lise Schüppach and me playing because the two voices are so interconnected that many times you can't tell who, who is who, who plays what. And it's a polyphony, but where the two voices become sort of unit. Yeah, you're, you never think you hear two instruments. You think sometimes you hear 10 instruments or 20 instruments, sometimes one. It's very different. In uh, Philippe Jacot, it's never this pathetic way of writing poems. It's a very, very modest and very intimate way of feeling nature, of hearing the drops of falling water, of hearing the birds singing in the night. And for me, birds, it's also a very mysterious word when, when you hear blackbirds, for instance, 20 blackbirds, they never sing the same. 
music, never the same rhythm, never the same length of strophes. It's so rich, it's like a music where you are unable to, to write it exactly down. It's so rich in minimal intervals and thirds of tones and little, little portamentis. And the rhythms are never symmetrical, like a flower is never symmetrical, like a crystal is never symmetrical, like your heartbeat is never symmetrical. Only in pop music you have the boom, boom, boom rhythm, and this doesn't exist in the world. Yeah. The, the clock, we, we are measuring our life about a measurement which doesn't exist. Time is illusionary, it doesn't exist really. And, uh, and birds really bring to the ears this world which is so rich and so, so mysterious and you never can come to the end of, of hearing new things in the bird songs. But in this piece I, I didn't try to imitate birds exactly. But it is also such a, a world of sounds which is far away of what you expect of two double reed instruments, oboe and, uh, and English horn. It's a sort of, a, of nocturnal, very mysterious sounding, just like breathing and very soft things and then suddenly something loud and again silence. It's exactly what you feel when you are alone by night in a forest or in a garden and have your ears wide open. 